Oh, wow, we have a lot of attendees today. Um, so again, just good morning, everybody. My name is Tatiana Calderon. I'm the Autism Initiative Coordinator. As I mentioned before, we'll just get to, uh, started in a few minutes. We're just allowing a moment for people to get situated. So if you need anything, this is definitely the time to do so. Um, I do want to mention this presentation is being live streamed um, on Facebook. So uh, just for everybody to be mindful when we are sharing questions, um, throughout the presentation or at the end, uh, just to keep some private information private, just as it is being shared on a public forum. Um, and now I'll be giving um, instructions for Spanish viewers. So, buenos días a todos que nos están reuniendo por Zoom. Hoy siempre brindamos servicios de interpretación simultánea para nuestros eventos. So, si usted necesita interpretación al español, por favor de hacer clic en el globo al fondo de su pantalla, donde dice interpretación. Luego haga clic en el idioma que desea escuchar, en este caso español. Um, si solo quiere escuchar al intérprete, uh, puede también hacer clic en Mute Original Audio, que silenciará el audio original. So, muchísimas gracias y de nuevo ben, bienvenidos a Sinergia. Estamos agradecido, agradecidos de tenerlos aquí. Um, as I mentioned before to everybody joining us right now, this is being shared on a public forum. Um, you will be receiving the presentation um, via a follow-up email, so there's no worries about that. As I said, um, we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation or at the end. Please feel, she, uh, please feel free to share them through our chat or Q&A box. Um, and let's get started. So for those that don't know me, my name is Tatiana Calderon. I'm the Autism Initiative Coordinator here at Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center. Um, I just wanted to share a few words about Synergia's Autism Initiative before we get started on our presentation this morning. Um, so the Autism Ini Initiative Project is funded by a grant from the New York City um, Council under its Autism Initiative. This project supplements the work of Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center, or MPC, by bringing increased awareness to New York City residents, uh, particularly to communities with large Spanish-speaking populations, about the growing population of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Its strong outreach component targets families of children with a suspected or known diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, who are not receiving appropriate educational, health, or other related services. The initiative will link them to other services and supports that meet the individual needs of children and their families. So once again, thank you so much for being here um, today. And right before we get into it, I just want to share a little bit of information about our presenter today. So with us today, we have our wonderful presenter, Erin Shanahan. She is a doctoral student. Um, as I mentioned, Erin is a doctoral stu student in the School of Psychology program at Fordham University and has worked in multiple child research settings around New York City, particularly in, Bro in the Bronx, sorry, at Montefiore, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and now the Child Mind Institute. Uh, she also has a behavioral specialist at the Harry H. Gordon School and a kindergarten classroom teacher at the Warwick Valley Central School District. Um, welcome to Synergia, Erin. We're so happy that you can join us today. Um, so I'll pass it on over to you. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Um, let me get started just by sharing my presentation. Give me one moment to get set up. Okay. I'm going to also see if I can move our chat box on my other screen so I can see if anybody has a question in real time. Yep. Perfect. Okay, let's get started. So today I was going to talk to you all about understanding and managing difficult behaviors, and I was going to try to focus on children with autism spectrum disorder. Currently, um, as was mentioned, I'm working at the Child Mind Institute. Um, this is an outpatient um, clinic in New York City, in Manhattan. Before that, though, I've worked around New York City I worked at Montefiore in the Bronx. I was doing research with children with autism with Dr. Eric Hollander. Um, and now the Child Mind Institute, I'm in their autism center there. Um, in addition to that, I have a particular interest in our little ones, the preschoolers, early intervention. My dissertation research is on the preschool transition. And then I also was a kindergarten teacher for one year actually during the pandemic in a socially distanced classroom. 
Um, being a kindergarten teacher was like one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. And it's also one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, I absolutely loved it. I miss it all the time, but I really love working with little ones. And I also like working with kids with autism. So if you have any questions about anything in that realm, I'm here to help. I can also troubleshoot, you know, anything you got going on with the older ones. My training is in all school age children. Um, but today I want to talk to you guys. Oh, before I do that, I'm also here through um, CCMH, our clinical mental health services for the Bronx community. So on Tuesday, Thursday and Friday nights, I do um, individual counseling with children who live in the Bronx through a grant um, through Fordham University. It's all virtual counseling. So it's all on Zoom and it's at no cost for 10 sessions. Um, if you or someone you know would be interested in participating in that, I have the information here. I'm going to share it at the end as well, and I'm sure we can send it all to you. Um, but yes, it's a free service. It's really lovely. I've been so happy being a part of this group. And we also do um, these kind of activities where we give presentations on topics related to, to child care and school and, and mental health issues. Okay. Um, Here's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. I'm going to talk to you about child behavior, managing difficult behaviors. Um, you know, I think all parents have been there. It doesn't matter um, how old your child is or what how you how you parent your child. All children at some point display some difficult behaviors to manage. Um, so today I want to take some time to. Um, talk about the models of behavior, kind of like some theories behind behavior and why behaviors happen. Um, I'm going to talk about the function of behaviors, and then I'm going to talk about some really specific ways that we can manage behaviors as parents, teachers, um, just, you know, adults working with, with children. And then at the end, I would love um, to try to target any specific needs you all have and discuss, you know, maybe specific behaviors going on in your community, with your child, in your school, wherever you're coming from today. And we could try to troubleshoot together some ways to, to help manage specific challenging behaviors. So think of that as we're going through. Um, but I'd like to start with the ABC model of behavior. Um, so here's a big fact. A lot of problem behaviors are learned. It doesn't necessarily mean that these behaviors are taught. So what I mean by that is that, you know, no parent is trying to teach their kid um, a behavior that that is maladaptive or not helpful. Um, but they are behaviors are the re the result of conditions in in a child's environment. Um, the classic example is like, a kiddo at the grocery store checkout, they really want that candy bar so bad. And, you know, you don't have the cash for that right now, or they already had a treat today. And they, you say, no, no candy bar. And then what happens? The kid might throw a tantrum, crying, rolling around on the floor. And then it's a public environment. You're just trying to get home. So you give them the candy bar. Um, Right. And that's a learned behavior. So now the kiddos learned, OK, when we're in distress mode, if I yell and scream on the floor, I get what I want. Um, but the good news is that even though, you know, behaviors are learned, we can also teach appropriate behaviors using those like same paradigms. So that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. So when we think about behavior, we think about it in this pattern. There's an antecedent then the behavior occurs, and then there's a consequence. So an antecedent is what comes before the behavior. It's like the trigger for the behavior. So maybe in that in that grocery store paradigm I just provided, it might be like getting to the checkout line or like, um, you know, wanting the candy bar, like, like seeing the candy bar. That might be that trigger. And then the, or in addition to the, that, the antecedent would probably be a parent saying, no, you can't have the candy bar. The behavior is the child's response to that antecedent. So in that grocery store paradigm, it's, you know, screaming, throwing a tantrum, um, rolling around on the floor. And then the consequence, that's what occurs after the behavior. It's the response. So in that paradigm I gave, the, the parent gave the candy bar to the child. So when the child rolled around on the floor screaming, they received a candy bar for that behavior. 
So I'm gonna talk a little more in depth about each one of these parts. Antecedents, those are the situations or events that come before a behavior. It's sometimes called the trigger. It can be an event, a person, an object in the environment. So an example would be like telling a child to do their homework. You know, the behavior that occurs after that, the antecedent is telling the child to do their homework. So I have a little bit of some audience participation now. If you guys could use your chat box, we'll see if this works. Um, I want some help identifying these antecedents, what's happening before the behavior. So let's do the first one together. It says, Susan hits Fred after he takes the book she is looking at. So what's the antecedent? If people could try to use the chat box, we'll see if this works. Okay, Fred taking the book, taking the book. He took the book. Perfect, you guys are right on. So, you know, Susan hits Fred. The antecedent was that Fred took the book away. The behavior was Susan hit him, perfect. Let's do the next one. Okay, the next one says, Mary starts to interrupt her father by screaming when he is talking on the phone. What is the antecedent here? Mm, okay, father talking on the phone. She wants his attention down on the phone. Right, so the, the antecedent, what's happening beforehand is the father is talking on the phone. Some of you are getting at a good point we're gonna talk about later, like why behaviors occur, what, what the function of the behavior is, what the child is trying to get. And a lot of you are talking about getting attention. That's good. That's the next step we're gonna talk about. But just the antecedent, the behavior happening before is the father talking on the phone. Great job. Okay, let's do this one. Randy throws his vegetables after his mother puts them on his plate. What's the antecedent? Perfect. Yep, veggies on the plate. So the antecedent here is that the mother puts the veggies on the plate, then the behavior occurs, Randy throws them, right? So the antecedent is putting them on the plate. Last one here, Noah screams when he sees the playground on the way to the doctor's office. This one's a little tricky. What do you guys think? What's the antecedent? No, it screams when he sees the playground on the way to the doctor's office. Seeing the playground, doctor's office, right. This one's tricky because we might need a little more information. Like if I was working with this family and we were trying to see how we can, you know, make the screaming go away, I'd probably ask a few more questions. Does he scream every time he sees the playground in the car or only when he's going to the doctor's? In that case, it might be going to the doctors at the antecedent, but if it's every time, then it's just like seeing the playground, you know? But nice job. Okay, good work. Thanks for participating. Okay, so we talked about antecedent, now we're talking about behavior. So a note about behavior. Behavior is any action that can be observed, counted, or timed. So it's really important when adults are working with like teachers or other childcare professionals um, that we're using really specific and detailed descriptions of the child's behavior. This is so that everybody can know exactly what's going on and be on exactly the same page. So vague descriptions don't give us a clear picture of what's happening. So this is, a, this is an example I like to use a lot. Um, you know, a mom might say this to me when I was a kindergarten teacher, Oh, Tom's been really bad at school. He's been disobedient. He's been bad. Is he bad at school? And, you know, a teacher would say like, uh, Tom's usually good. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes he's stubborn. These words aren't super specific. So what do we think would be like a more specific exchange? Anyone want to take a guess in the chat? Like what might be more specific than saying disobedient or bad? I'll go through this one. So a more specific exchange would be talking about, yes, describing the specific behaviors. Oh, he's not listening at home. Yes, very good. Um, so, so speaking exactly about what's happening. So here's a more specific exchange. A mom might say, Tom has been hitting me at home. 
Is he hitting you at school, right? Hitting is a behavior. We can measure it. You know, how many times does a child hit? We can count it. Um, you know, another like more specific behavior might be crying. We can like time how long someone's crying or how many times a day they're crying. Um, what's our word? Speaking out, like calling out, cutting people off during conversation. These are behaviors we can count. We can measure them. It's really helpful when you're working with teachers that you're really specific in your language about what's going on. Um, so that's a, that's a piece about behavior. Okay. So now we've talked about antecedents, what happens before the actual behavior. Now we're going to talk about consequences. So that's about what immediately happens after or in response to a behavior. So it could be like a natural consequence. So for example, you know, most of the time kids touch a stove once and they learn right away <laughs> that they're not going to do that again, right? If they touch a hot stove, they get a burn, they get an ouchie, they don't want to do that again. It's a natural consequence. Um, getting a Coke out of a vending machine, right? We, that's nothing's better than feeling that Coke fall and taking your first sip. It's a natural consequence. It reinforces the behavior. Um, consequences are the reasons we keep using a behavior whether it is positive or negative. So for example, if you raise your hand in class, right, the consequence is that you might get called on. You get attention from the teacher. But in the same way, you know, telling a rude joke when you're, when you're a little kid on the playground, that also gets you attention. And that's what reinforces that behavior. So it, it can be positive or negative. Um, a lot of times I talk about the dirty lollipop paradigm. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times kids will, will do things, you know, like it, when a, when a kid has a lollipop and it falls on the ground, they still put that lollipop in their mouth sometimes. Um, so, so children will a lot of times do behaviors that might get them in trouble, but it gets them attention. So they keep doing it. Right. So if a kid, you know, um, um, I'm sure parents have been here sometimes too when you say don't touch that and your kid like kind of saunters over and almost touches something they're not supposed to it's to get that behavior to get that attention um one of the things that's important when we're talking about consequences is that sometimes it's hard to find out like why this behavior is happening what is going on what is my kid getting out of this um we like to take a systematic approach so we want to track our antecedents and our consequences, and this can help us select the best strategy for changing a behavior. Sometimes this might um, occur in schools. A lot of times in schools, they'll call this a functional behavior assessment. So just as a word, I know a bit about IEPs. I'm a school psychologist. This is some of my background as well. Um, so if you're a parent and you know maybe you're in the IEP process, if Somebody in the school says, oh, we want to get you your services. We're just waiting to do the functional behavior assessment. That's the purpose of it. It's to understand the antecedents, the consequences of the behaviors, and then um, it'll help inform the IEP process. It helps inform, um, you know, like what, what is going to, um, what services will be of the most use for your child. So just as a side note, that's what a functional behavior assessment is. Okay, behaviors are often a form of communication. So especially for youth with autism, um, I wanted to take some time during this presentation to speak directly towards autism. So I'll do that now. Um, you know, a lot of times if the, you're seeing a recurring behavior that is like maladaptive, not helpful, um, you know, disruptive, there's usually a reason for it. So a good place to start is to always think, what is my child trying to communicate with this behavior? What are they trying to get at? They might be trying to say like, this is too hard. Leave me alone. <laughs> Spend time with me. Or that's mine. Give it back. And these are all, you know, realistic things to communicate. It's about teaching our children more appropriate forms of communication than like hitting someone perhaps or screaming, right? So in psychology, we've kind of found that especially with little ones, there's sort of these like 
four primary functions of behavior. Most of the time, if we're seeing a recurring behavior, it tends to fall into one of these categories. So the first one here is to escape or avoid. So the behavior that a child is doing allows the child to escape or avoid the situation. For example, a really good one. A lot of times, this happened to me when I was a kindergarten teacher a lot. The second I would start a math lesson, I always had this one child who would raise their hand and say, I have to go to the bathroom every single time, no matter what. It was always during math class. And it was an escape function, right? They, they're they trying to get out of doing math. This might happen a lot when kids are doing homework at home with you. So, you know, maybe you sit them down at the kitchen table, say, okay, it's time to do your worksheet. And they might do that too. They might say, oh, I'm hungry. I need a snack. Or, oh, my tummy hurts. I need a break. <laughs> I need to use the bathroom. You know, these behaviors are, are to avoid or escape a situation. Another reason that kids do things to get behavior, which I think parents are pretty keen on understanding this one or seeing it a lot. And it's this attention piece. So the behavior allows the child to get attention. Um, so in school, the classic example is like calling out, not raising your hand, or, um, you know, maybe like doing something to pester a classmate, like, or brother or sister at home, like poking the brother or sister until they, until they like react and give attention. So those are some examples. A third function is access. So the behavior allows them to gain access to an item they wanted. You know, maybe it's like grabbing um, the iPad away from a sibling, right? Not really the behavior we want them to be doing. We want them to ask and say, please, but grabbing it gives them access to the behavior. Um, it could also be... Um, Sometimes this happens, this comes up with like sleep training too. Um, you know, kids might be getting out of bed in the middle of the night to try to access items they want, or even mom, like they want to, they want mom in the night. So they go into the bedroom, things like that. Okay. And then the last bit also comes up a lot for kids with autism. So we need to kind of be careful about how we shape these sort of behaviors, but there's a lot of behaviors that are automatically rewarding. So like automatically pleasing to the child. A really good example of this is with kids with autism, they tend to do something called stimming behaviors. Um, stimming behaviors are movements or vocalizations even sometimes that are repetitive in nature, and they seem to like self-soothe the child. A common example of this in autism is flapping. So when a child like puts their arms up and down over and over again, Spinning is a really common example of this in autism. Maybe rubbing your face on certain objects with texture, so like blankets or even like rough surfaces. Um, these behaviors, especially for kiddos with autism, are automatically rewarding. They um, put the child at ease. They regulate the child. And so a lot of times the you know, the instruction for children with autism is we don't necessarily want to stop these behaviors completely because they help regulate the child. Um, but they're not always socially acceptable in all contexts. So in that case, we want to provide another outlet for that child to get that type of stimming behavior or that automatically rewarding behavior that's more socially acceptable. And there's a lot of tools out there nowadays for this. So for example, um, you know, some kids with, or even kids with like um, ADHD too, you know, they have that hyperactivity and it feels good for them to move a lot, right? And like move their legs or maybe jitter a bit. So there's a lot of things that we can provide to them to have them, you know, get that outlet and get that automatically rewarding feeling and behavior without it being socially unacceptable. So for example, kiddos with autism, I know, um, a lot of teachers have these rubber bands that go on their chairs and they can bounce their legs on the chair and it gets out some of that like hyperactivity energy, but it's under the desk, it's not disturbing the other classmates and you know, it's, it's good for everyone that way. A lot of times kids with autism really love what we call sensory tools and there's a whole, I don't have any around me right now, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds. So there's like stress squeeze balls. There's these like little boxes with bubbles and you can push the bubbles in and out. Um, 
sometimes having like a texture blanket or like a rag or something in their pocket and that can help them with a the sensory feeling they feel that so there's lots of different things like spinners those spinner toys there's lots of different tools we can use if you know some of the stimming behaviors that you might see with kids with autism might not always be socially acceptable um or or even like healthy sometimes we see stimming behaviors that might in fact be dangerous so some kids with autism might be, um, you know, like hitting their head in the wall or like smacking their leg. We'd want to try to shape a behavior that's more safe, um, like using a spinner or using a, a sensory tool. So those are the four functions of behavior. We got escape or avoid, attention, access, and like automatic rewarding, rewarding or self-soothing. It's not always this simple, though. A behavior could initially have one function, but then it takes on a different function based on what else is happening in the environment too. So some examples might be like biting nails. For some people, biting nails might begin as like a self-soothing thing, but it can also um, be, you know, so, so, and what I mean by that is biting nails can be a self-soothing thing, especially when kids are anxious. A lot of times we see kids biting their nails when they're anxious. Um, but it can also be something that's then done for attention. If they know mommy will say, Hey, put your hands on your mouth. They might do it just to, just to get mom to talk to them. <laughs> um, staying home from school. Um, this can have many functions too, like attention from mom or like maybe even some self-soothing to avoidance, avoiding school. So there can be lots of different functions involved here. Um, you know, yelling that could have a, a million functions, um, saying things that, a different way or vocal stereotypy. So vocal stereotypy, what that means is, um, especially with kids with autism, they tend to repeat phrases they hear over and over and over again, um, especially from like cartoons they love, like Bluey is something I hear a lot of lines from that show over and over again, or like Spidey. Um, so, you know, that behavior can be self-soothing, but it can also be a bid for attention as well. Okay, so I'm gonna do some more activities now. So get ready to use the chat to participate. Um, we're gonna try to identify the function of these behaviors. Okay, so here's the situation. Ryan is given a turkey sandwich for lunch. That's the antecedent. The behavior, Ryan falls to the floor and screams that he's want Pop-Tarts for lunch. And the consequence is that his mother takes the sandwich away and starts toasting some Pop-Tarts. So what's the function here? Is it escape avoidance, attention seeking, um, to get what he wants, automatically rewarding? What do we think? You can use the chat to par participate. What is Ryan... What is the function of this behavior Ryan's doing? Access. Nice. Yes. So in this situation, it's all about access. Yes, rewarding, getting what he wants. Um, he wants that Pop-Tart. He's going to scream on the floor. And mom's going to make up some Pop-Tarts. <laughs> nice. Let's try this one now. So the antecedent here. Ryan gets in the car to drive to school. The behavior is that Ryan flaps his hands. The consequence is that his mother turns the radio on to his favorite station. What do we think's going on here? What's the function of this behavior? It seems like Ryan might be a kiddo with autism. So perhaps it's, oh, okay, communicating. Mm -hmm automatically rewarding and to get what he wants. So it could be escape avoidance, attention seeking to get what he wants or automatically rewarding. What do we think? Hmm, some difficulty expressing what he wants. Escape. Okay, this is a tricky one. So typically in autism, flapping hands tends to be a stimming behavior. And we've learned that these behaviors are automatically rewarding. They're self-soothing. Um, so in this situation, his mother turned the radio station onto his favorite station. 
And that's another way that he can have some self-soothing as well. So typically a lot when we see kiddos with autism doing these stimming behaviors, what they're trying to communicate is, I feel dysregulated. I don't feel right. I need to do something to regulate my brain and my body. So in this situation, the mom decided to put on his favorite radio station to see if that would help regulate him. So nice job. This one I would say is an automatically rewarding behavior to flap his hands. Let's try another one. This one says Ryan's mother tells him to clean his room. The behavior is that Ryan cries and whines to his mom that he doesn't want to clean his room right now. The consequence is his mother gives him a hug, tells him not to cry, and talks to him about the importance of cleaning his room. So what's this behavior? What's the function of this behavior? Ryan crying and whining to his mom. Is it escape or avoidance? Attention seeking? To get what he wants? Automatically rewarding. What do we think? Avoidance. Okay. What else? Escape avoidance. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. You guys got this one. It's escape or avoidance. He doesn't want to clean his room. <laughs> um, and in this case, it's great. He's he's communicating exactly why this behavior is happening. Um, and it sounds like the mother, as a consequence, takes some time to explain why this needs to get done. But yes, this is an escape or avoidance behavior. Nice job. All right, here's another one. Ryan's mother tells him to do his homework. The behavior is Ryan runs away into his bedroom. And the consequence is his mother lets him stay up there because he's being quiet. So what type of function is this? Running away into his bedroom. What do we think? Yes, some escape and avoidance. Again, same thing. Escape or avoidance, that's the function of this behavior. He doesn't want to do his homework. Nice. Okay, so now we're going to put it all together. Again, feel free to use the chat to participate with me. So we're going to find out the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence of this vignette. Here we go. Michael is watching cartoons with his brother in the family room when his brother suddenly decides to change the channel. Michael hits his brother and Michael's mother scolds him and sends him to his room. Let's start with the antecedent. Use the chat and let me know what the antecedent is for this story up here. What happened first? Changing the channel, perfect, yes. That was the antecedent. The first thing that happened was his brother suddenly changed the channel. Nice work. Let's move on to the behavior. What's the behavior? What does Michael do? Hits his brother. Yep, hits. Perfect. That's the behavior. And it's a that's a good descriptor of the behavior, right? Because we can measure it. How many times does it happen? How intense is it? How long is he hitting his brother for? That's a very specific behavior we can measure. So hits, good job. Okay, now let's talk about the consequence. What was the consequence of the behavior? What happened once Michael hit his brother? He gets scolded. Mm -hmm. Yes, so his mother scolds him and sends him to his room. That's the consequence. So now let's talk about the function. Remember we talked about those four functions of behavior. What do we think the function was? Why did he hit his brother? We talked about the four functions as, right, um, escape, to get something, um, naturally stimulating, naturally soothing, naturally pleasing. Um, and then what was the other one? I forgot. <laughs> Oh, attention seeking. What do we think? What's the function of this behavior? Why did Monk Michael hit his brother? We're doing this last one down here. What do we think is the function of Michael's behavior? Mm, he stopped watching the cartoon. Mm -hmm. What else? To 
to communicate his displeasure and get attention. Access to the TV. Perfect. So I would say in this situation, the behavior was due to access. You know, he was watching the show he wanted to. His brother changed the channel and he wanted his show back. He wanted access to his show. So he hit his brother as a result to get what he wants. Right. Access. Perfect. So that's the function of this behavior. Nice work. Let's try another one. Okay. So Susie is playing a game on the computer when her father tells her that it's time to turn it off so she can start her homework. Susie falls to the floor, screaming and kicking. In an attempt to stop Susie from waking up the baby, Susie's father tells her that she can have a few more minutes on the computer. All right, let's go through it again. What's the antecedent in this case? Right, turn off the TV. Yes, get off the computer, mm -hmm. turn off the computer. So her father tells her it's time to get off the computer. That's the antecedent, the father gives a directive. Great, so what was Susie's behavior then? She doesn't wanna do that. Mm -hmm. Falls to the floor, kicking and screaming through a tantrum. Great. Falling to the floor, kicking and screaming. That's good. It's very specific, right? The behavior exactly is the screaming. That's something we can measure and count. And kicking. That's something we can measure and count. Um, tantruming is also true. That's that's what I think this could be described as. Um, when we're speaking with our child care providers, using that super specific language can be helpful. So like screaming and kicking. Nice. Okay, and then what was the consequence of the behavior? So she fell to the floor kicking and screaming, then what was the consequence? Mm. Got extra time, allowed her more time to use the computer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think this is a really great example because I think this is a super common thing that happens, right? Sometimes our kids are having big behaviors and it's in situations that we just can't have them having that right now. Like the baby is asleep, we're out in public. It's a real thing that happens and sometimes we need to give in. And it's it's a tough thing with parenting because we want to be consistent. Um, but at, at times, you know, we're not in a good situation to, to have that happen. And we can think about how we can shape the appropriate behavior in maybe situations where we can to give the time to our child to do that. So I think this is a really great example. It happens a lot. Um, okay, and then again, the function of the behavior, right? Like, why did Susie do this? What was What was the function? Was it soothing to get access? to get attention or to escape? What was the function of this behavior, the screaming and kicking? To get access, yep, to get access to the computer. Mm -hmm. I think this one's definitely to get access, to keep using that computer, but it could also be to avoid as well, because her dad told her to, to, it's time to start her homework, she might be, avoiding the homework too. So it has two functions. Nice job. Okay. So this is just a summary of everything I've spoken to you about so far. This ABC model of behavior, there's always an antecedent of behavior and then the consequence and then the four functions of behavior. So the reason I want to take so much time to go over this like kind of theory part of child behavior is because it's always a great place to start as a parent. If you're ever really confused, like, why does this keep happening? It's nice to think of these two big concepts. You know, what's happening before the behavior? What's happening afterwards? Can I change something there? Can I change something that's happening before or after? Um, and then it's also good to think about the function. Okay, my kid is doing this because they want attention from me. Maybe I should think about other ways that I can give them attention that's more appropriate for the situation. Or... You know, me and my kids trying to get out of doing this. Maybe I should think about ways to make the experience more enjoyable for them or how I can be make the situation more rewarding. 
So this is just my summary page that I wanted to have for you guys here. So now that we understand behaviors, how the heck do we manage them? What do we do about it? Um, that's the big question. So one thing to talk about generally is that all behaviors are so different. So it's kind of hard to give a big overview of how we can manage all challenging behaviors. It's rarely a one size fits all situation. But I wanted to go through a couple, you know, helpful tips and tricks that I found in my work um, that might be helpful for you at home or at school, wherever you work with kids. Okay, so I started talking about this a little bit. Assess the ABCs and assess the function of behavior. I think this is always a great place to start, especially when it comes to like a behavior that's happening over and over again, maybe at the same time. I tend to find that parents talk about, um, I tend to find that parents talk a lot about like how a behavior happens in a routine every day. So for example, like trying to get out the door to go to school, maybe there's a challenging behavior happening then, or maybe before bedtime, you're trying to start that bedtime routine and maybe a challenging behavior is happening then. So in those situations, it's really great to take time to assess those ABCs and assess the functions of each behavior. Um, so, and that will help us find where to intervene. So can the antecedent be amended, that first piece? So here's an example. When a child hears the bath running, they hide. So where could we intervene here? You know, maybe you get the kid in the bathroom first and like, whatever, ready to jump in. And then you turn the water on. That might help if you change the antecedent there. Change what happens leading up to bath time to make it more um, exciting. Maybe you can involve them in that. They can turn on the faucet themselves. They can play with the water as it comes out using some toys in the bathtub, right? We can change what happens before the typical behavior, and that might change the behavior in and of itself. So that's the antecedent piece. Maybe we can change the consequence, right? And like the classic example, the, that grocery store, when the kid cries in the grocery store, they're giving candy. How can we intervene here? What's a different consequence we can have? You know, maybe we can tell the child, you know, you can't have the candy here. We have candy at home. If we can get through the grocery store, you know, within the next five minutes, we can have candy at home. We just can't have it here. Something like that. You can change the consequence of a situation. The last piece is always to consider the function or the purpose of the behavior. So, um, you know, is there something we can do in another way? I talked about this a little bit before, how especially with our kiddos with autism, we know that a lot of times they're they're doing this stimming behavior, self-soothing, um, and sometimes they can be harmful and we need to, to shape a new behavior instead. So if a child is doing a harmful stim, like hitting his leg, maybe we can try to introduce other um, regulation tools. So, um, you know, like I know stress balls for the, for the kiddos who hit tend to be pretty effective, something like that. Okay, routine and consistency. So this is so key. We know that kids thrive on routine and consistency. When you talk to teachers, especially the early education teachers, if you ask them what's the most important for them to, to start with right away to make sure super clear in the beginning of the school year, they're gonna say routine and consistency. Kids thrive on it. They love routine and consistency. Um, they like to have clear expectations for their activities and they like to know how they can earn their rewards. So for example, if a child knows that every night they get to pick out their favorite story after they take a bath, brush their teeth and put on their PJs, they're more likely to perform those activities quickly in order to get to that story. And if they know they get that story no matter what, every single time, then that only reinforces those positive behaviors we want, like brushing teeth, getting in the tub, putting your PJs on. So they like to know what's gonna happen. They like the consistency. We also know that kids crave trust and dependability in order to reduce their stress. You know, when you think about it, kids really are, are giving themselves to adults, to they depend on them to take care of them and make sure all their needs are met. And it can be a little stressful, right? Having caregivers that have consistency and routine, it reduces stress in children. It helps them know, okay, my needs will be met 
And that will also then decrease some unhelpful behaviors, maladaptive behaviors. Next, um, I find this really helpful for parents. It takes a little effort to create one, but a lot of kids really benefit from visual schedules. Um, this is a go-to for me in my practice, working with parents, especially when I'm hearing that there's a, a phase of the routine that is consistently a problem, like, like bedtime perhaps. Having a visual schedule for the kid to know, okay, this is what we're doing every night. After you were gonna play until eight o'clock, at eight o'clock, we start bedtime routine. You brush your teeth, then we go in the tub, then we put our PJs on, then we get in bed, and then mommy reads you a story. Having a visual aid for kids gives them that, um, you know, it gives them a little bit of like uh, uh, independence or they, they know what's gonna happen next. They feel trust because they can see it and they know what's going to happen. And this can be really helpful. Um, it's help. It's especially helpful to have those visual schedules for our kids who are developing language. So maybe our younger kids or maybe kiddos with autism who are still developing language. It can be really helpful. First then is a really simple way to do it. Um, so like you can have with, you know, for maybe for a bedtime, it can be, you know, first we go to the bathroom, then we read our story right? Like that could be a really simple version first then. Um, I think I have some examples. Yes. So here's some examples of visual schedules that I find are really helpful. Um, you know, this one's fun. Get up for a nap, get a snack, play a game, go outside, sensory play, do a chore, dinner, brush teeth, bedtime. And there's these check boxes so kids can like check it off as they go. Um, so having some sort of visual schedule like this can be helpful and you can make it really specific for specific events. And then this is a first then, um, like a really simple visual schedule. So first we eat dinner, then we have a cookie. These sort of things can be helpful for your kid to, to know what the deal is and what the reward is. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is effective reinforcement. One of my biggest advice for parents always is catch them being good. So often we like catch our kids being bad. We want to catch them being good as much as we possibly can. Um, you know, how many times a day are you delivering like a compliment or praise to your child? Kids are learning. They make a lot of mistakes. They've only been on this earth for so long. So we really want them to feel the consequence of being good, of like doing the right thing. Um, so we really want to provide them with as much verbal praise as possible. They need the input. They need to know what they're doing right instead of only hearing what they're doing wrong because it can be really discouraging. Like even think about, um, you know, being at work. Like if you only have a boss who who comes to see you when you've done something wrong, right? It makes you anxious then to see that boss. <laughs> like You want a boss that's also going to let you know like when you did a great job. It's kind of the same thing. If you think about a kid's job is to be a kid and to play and to learn, and we're like their, their boss giving them feedback, we want to give them that positive feedback too. So, you know, whenever I have parents, I always start by telling them to really, really try to increase the amount of praise they're giving their kid. Catch them being good as much as you can. And then when you're giving praise, there's a lot of important ways to do it. So, so being really, really specific is important. So here's an example uh, that a teacher might use, I guess, in a classroom. A teacher might say like, Allie, thank you for lining up quickly and quietly. Super specific praise, right? It's saying, I like that you did this. You lined up and you did it quickly and quietly. It's very specific. Yes. So... And then another thing I want to talk about too is praise efforts over innate abilities. I find a lot of parents might say things like, you're so smart. You're the smartest kid in the world. Like that would be their praise or like, you're the best at math. Um, and that's coming from such a good place. You know, we all love our kids so much and we do think they're the best. Um, but we want to really praise efforts over just innate ability. This often comes into like a problem later down the line when you're praising kids for their innate abilities rather than how hard they're trying. Um, you know, it can kind of cause kids to think like, oh, I have to be the best to get praise. Like I have to do things 
the best to get my reward. So we encourage parents to praise their innate ability instead. So like maybe when a kid finishes a math sheet, instead of saying like, I love how smart you are in math, say something like, I love how much effort you put into this work. Um, Cause we really want to praise the effort. We want to continue that, that behavior. We want to praise the specific behavior. So um, next is thinking about effective rewards. This can be really hard. I find that this is what I'm troubleshooting with parents a lot when we're making behavior plans. Thinking of like an appropriate reward is really hard. So we want them to be, we want rewards to be incentivizing and, but we also want them to be like delivered quickly depending on the behavior and also like the cognitive ability of the child. Um, so for example, like I always think this is a funny example, but Sometimes when I'm working with parents on like potty training for little ones and toddlers, you know, their, their cognitive ability is, is low still. They're like maybe two and a half, three years old. Like it's pretty low still. Um, so that means we need to make sure that they understand what exactly the behavior is that they're getting rewarded for. So a lot of times I have parents, like when the kiddo is on the toilet and makes their first movement, like praise them immediately. Like if they're still on the toilet, that's even better. Give them an M&M like right away, <laughs> like do it as quick as you can because you want to make sure they know exactly like, oh, I'm getting this reward because of what I just did, like what just happened. So these are all things to take into account when you're picking a reward. You also want the reward to be like, you want some quick rewards so we can we can really associate the behavior with doing well, the behavior with the reward. But some big awards might rewards might be more helpful for our older kiddos too. So like a lot of times, you know, I might have for for older kids, maybe like middle schoolers or something, it's like, okay, we need to get you need to be out at the bus stop every day at this time, or like we need to be in the car ready to go at this time every day. And if you do it five days of the week, then you'll earn your big reward. And a big reward might be like extra iPad time next week or picking the family dinner, picking the family TV show game, um, picking a new toy from the dollar store or Amazon or something like that. So quick rewards can be things like very good, effective verbal praise, little little treats like an M&M or a Skittle or something, um, Hershey Kiss, <laughs> stickers, kids love stickers, high fives are really good too. Kids will do anything for a high five. So those are just some things to think about. Think of an effective reward for your kids. We want to reward them for their efforts. Um, then make expectations for rewards clear. So this is hard. Sometimes we need to... Um, be really specific about the expectation to receive the reward. Um, only deliver the reward when the preferred behavior is seen. So if you're using like M&Ms for potty training, for example, don't give M&Ms at other times. Like don't give out M&Ms just because. M&Ms are just for potty training and that's it, right? Try and deliver the reward as soon as possible, right? So that's the example I was saying, like you might give a kid an M&M right when they're on the toilet and they did what they're supposed to um so yeah just make the the expectation for rewards super clear a lot of times writing them down or having like a little visual can be helpful too but just make sure it's super clear okay so effective reinforcement okay next i'm going to talk about plans ignoring this one we use a lot i put down here in the corner our um function of behavior that attention one Kids would do things to get attention sometimes. Um, so planned ignoring is not paying attention or not giving a reaction to a problem behavior in order to decrease that behavior in the future. So this happens a lot in like a classroom setting. Um, for example, you know, I had a kiddo who would call out answers in kindergarten. Super normal. Kids have a hard time like um, stopping themselves when they're excited, but we need to shape a better behavior. So I, I would ignore that child when he'd just yell out, that's not the appropriate behavior. And I've spoken to him about it. I, I wouldn't acknowledge that behavior, but when he would raise his hand, I'd make a point to call on him as much as I could because I wanted to reinforce the appropriate behavior, which is raising his hand. But I would plan ignore that um, problem behavior, which was calling out. So again, first step is assess the function of the behavior. Um, we know that it's really effective for those kiddos who are trying to get attention, that dirty lollipop paradigm I told you about. 
And we also want to operationalize the behavior. So what that means is we want to pick a specific recurring behavior and then operationalize it. So here's an example. At dinner, Eduardo bangs his spoon on the table to get our attention. So that's when you operationalize the behavior. It's banging the spoon on the table. And then maybe you tell everybody at the family table, okay, family, we're going to do some planned ignoring. When Eduardo bangs that spoon, don't take it away. Don't yell. Don't laugh along. We're going to do nothing. He gets no reward for that behavior at all. So that's an example of planned ignoring. The other thing to keep in mind with this is prepare for an extinction burst. Um, this is like a psychological concept that, that has been studied a lot and it happens very often. So what this means is that it usually gets worse before it gets better. If, it, if Eduardo was banging his spoon and every time he bangs his spoon, his little sister laughs and mommy says, no, 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 no. If that's what's been happening over and over and over again for weeks, when you stop giving that reward, he's going to say, what's this about? <laughs> and he might do it even more. Instead of banging the spoon for a minute, he might be banging that spoon for like five minutes saying, why is nobody giving me the usual attention I get? Um, it does die down. In, in research, it shows that typically problem behaviors might go up a little bit. And then after the kiddo learns, hey, I'm not getting the attention I used to they'll stop the behavior as time goes on. So just something to be aware of if you're doing some planned ignoring, it's possible that that behavior will increase first before it starts to decrease. Something to keep in mind. Okay, I'm also conscious of time. Okay, I'm just about at an hour. I think I have a little more time left, but um, give me a high sign if I need to wrap up. Um, clear consequences. So, this is kind of, when I say we prefer to use this as a last resort, I mean that typically we find that taking things away, timeouts, things like that, a lot of times it can result in power struggles. Um, so we really want to rely a lot more or as much as we possibly can on that, like catching them being good, the effective praise paradigm. We find that that's much more effective. Um but there are definitely situations where clear consequences are needed. So here's some advice when it comes to giving a clear consequence. You want to follow through no matter what. So if you give a consequence, you must follow through with it. Like we said, kids kind of crave consistency and they'll kind of smell it <laughs> if they know you give a consequence and you're not going to follow through with it. So if you say it, mean it. That's like the most important advice I can I can give. Um, so in that vein, be careful with the consequence you give. So a lot of parents I see will give a consequence that's like, especially if you're really hot and frustrated at a situation, you might say like, okay, if you don't stop this behavior, I'm taking the iPad away for two weeks or something. And if you can comply with that, then that's a fine consequence. If you can follow through with taking the iPad away for two weeks, then that's great. But what I find with parents is that, you know, a lot of times we use that iPad in situations where um, we need the kiddos to be quiet or like we, we are, we are traveling on an airplane and they need to, you know, they need to be quiet or they're at the doctors and they're going to get a shot and we want them to be distracted. And that's okay. Like, like real talk, it is okay to use these things in situations where we just simply like need our child to get through. That's fine. But that being said, then we can't make that a consequence for like a two week period. It's not realistic. So just pick realistic consequences that you can definitely follow through with. If you can follow through with not giving your kid an iPad for two weeks, then fabulous. Like that's fine to give as a consequence, but just make sure it's actually appropriate for your kid's age something that you can do as a family that you can actually follow through with. Timeouts, um, you know, timeouts, the traditional uh, rule of thumb with this is a minute timeout for every year of your child's age. So if you have like a three-year-old, a three-minute timeout is more than appropriate. Um, removal of preferred objects and treats. So, um, you know, maybe uh, if your kiddo receives dessert every night after dinner, they get their cookie you know, you can remove the cookie. You can say, okay, I need you to do this. But if we don't do this, then we don't get our cookie. Stuff like that. Okay. 
So that's it on clear consequences. Okay, good. So I'm at my hour mark. I wanted to take some time to open the conversation up. Um, I also did see that I was getting some longer responses in the chat in Spanish. I'm sorry I didn't read those ones, um, but I'd love to answer any questions you might have. We can also open up the conversation and talk about, you know, maybe some difficult behaviors that you might be working on with your child and we can brainstorm solutions together. Um, so if anybody wants to, to put a comment in the chat, um, I can, I can answer any questions you might have, or we can like brainstorm a difficult behavior. So I'll give everyone a second to use the chat and I'm going to take a sip of water. Also, if anybody would like, they can raise their hand and I, I can unmute you if you would like to ask your question, um, talking, if you'd like to Aaron as well. We have one, Miss Beatriz. Um, I'm going to allow you to talk so you can ask your question. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me, Erin? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to ask you, what is your advice when, uh, in this case, my child, he just wants to escape to the situations to avoid, mm -hmm. and uh, he just closest to everything he doesn't want to talk and 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 he just escapes he goes he hides he he moves around and and he just doesn't want to listen to anybody because mm. it, it, oh this is one of the things and I just you know what I do is just I I I leave him I give some space to him until he gets calm. And then I try to, again, go ahead if it's time for homework. But you know, there are times that, that I am waiting around an hour mm -hmm. to start doing homework with him, things like that. And I, I don't know how to manage because he loses his patience so fast and mm -hmm. he starts with a, kind of tantrums or you know I sincerely I have tried different approaches but what I do right now is just to leave him uh, a little bit on his you know giving some some time mm -hmm. for him to get calm mm -hmm. uh, I don't know I don't know do you have any advice yeah sure thank you for sharing that that sounds like a really frustrating situation I um I do have some advice and it sounds like you're doing some of the things that we've already spoken about, like kind of that planned ignoring bit, you know, the running and hiding. It's it's not the preferred activity. So you kind of give him some space. Um, I think it's great to think about how you can shape and reward the behaviors you're looking for. So in this situation, we're talking about, um, you know, a child who is one, trying to escape a non-preferred activity like doing homework. Um, and they're doing that by running and hiding around the home. And in addition to that, they might have some big um, emotional responses too. Um, I think I heard you talking about giving space to get calm. That's wonderful. I think one thing we'd want to reward is behaviors that are calming to the child. So for example, if you know your kiddo is having a big emotional reaction to being told it's time for homework, you see them start getting upset. You say, we need to calm down. And you see them take a big, deep breath. They go, <sighs> that's a really great behavior that we want to reinforce. Like, like thinking about what you want to reinforce in, in minute, tiny behaviors. So, so if you see your kiddo starting to calm down in any way, taking a deep breath, maybe even like pacing or something. Um, you see them doing specific behaviors to try to calm themselves down, reward those behaviors. Say, I love the way that you're trying to calm down right now. Or, um, you know, if they're taking deep breaths. That deep breath looks like it really helped you calm down, saying, being really specific about what you like about what they're doing and try to find it in the smallest ways that you can. Then when it comes to that avoidance, Typically with avoidance, the way we combat that is by um, creating a paradigm, creating a structure that can um, 
that provides a strong reinforcer at the end. So for example, um, if the goal is to get your child to sit down for homework, you know, maybe then the strong reinforcer might be once you sit down at the table, we'll have your favorite treat, then we'll do your homework, and then we'll have another reinforcer, whatever that might be. Maybe it's screen time or um, playing with mom or dad, um, stuff like that. So another good tip that we give a lot is this idea of like, when it comes to, to the schedule that you want to reinforce, try to sort things out with like a non-preferred activity followed by a preferred activity, non-preferred, preferred. So for your kiddo, if it's just getting them to the table to sit down, then I would give a reinforcer just for doing that, just for getting to the table and sitting down. It might be like having a cookie. First, we'll sit down at the table and have a cookie. Then we'll start homework. And once we do our homework, then we get another reward, you know? So I think in that situation, I would think really hard about what rewards would be good for your family and stagger them appropriately. I hope that's helpful. Okay, I see some things in the chat too. Let's see. Um, okay, okay, I see a lot of things. Let me start here, okay. Um, my child is diagnosed with autism. He tells a lot of lies. How can I help my child with this negative behavior? Okay, telling lies. I feel like I would want a little bit more specific information about that. But um, so lie, lying is a tough one because it's hard to know what's true and what's not, right? Um, again, we try really hard to shape the behaviors that we want. A lot of times with lying... In my practice with kids, I talk about the difference between lying and telling a fib, right? Like telling a fib is like silly. It's a silly story. It's not true. It's a joke. There's a difference between like a fib and then lying. So sometimes, you know, we talk about like that difference and explain. And then I reward kids when they might be telling a lie. And I say, is that a lie or a fib? Or is that the truth? And if they say, oh, it's just a fib, I would reward that behavior because they're admitting that it's not true. It was just to be silly. Um, so I think when it comes to like a lying paradigm, you want to find what type of behavior you want to reinforce there. So not lying is a tough behavior to reinforce. So maybe instead we what we want to reinforce is acknowledging the lie, like acknowledging that when they when they say, oh, I was just kidding. You could reward them for that. You could say, I really appreciate that you're telling me the truth. Let's have an m, &M. Like something like that can be really, really helpful. Um, but I would love to hear more about that too so I can find a way to better help with that situation. Let me attend to some of the, the other ones I see here. Um, Um, I learned that if I take something away that my son really likes because of his behavior, I also have to have something to replace it as well. Yeah, that's a really good point because sometimes we take things away from our kids, but they also still need stuff to do. <laughs> like they can't just, you can't just kind of take things away and then expect, you know, a four-year-old to entertain themselves with nothing, right? So, you know, if they can't have the tablet, you know, they can, I don't know, play with their uh, action figures instead. But they, their, their job is still to play. Um, we can't expect our kiddos to just like stare at a wall. So I think that's a really good point. If we take a preferred thing away, we do need to give a secondary option or else that's just going to cause more conflict. Good point. Erin, we did have one common Spanish um, of a parent saying, um, my, my son um, doesn't want to go to their therapies anymore. How could I manage this behavior? Okay, that's a really good one. I think that happens a lot. Um, in this situation, I'd really talk with your child's providers and talk to them about how we can make the experience more rewarding and enjoyable for the child. So most providers understand that if we don't get child buy-in, then we're not going to be effective in our therapies. So for example, you know, I've had, I had a child recently who in my therapy sessions with them, um, they just were not enjoying it. Like they did not want to be there. So I took time to just do what they wanted to do for a few sessions. Like I took time to say, you're directing the session. We're going to do what you want to do. 
And then from there, I kind of scaled back in the skills that I was teaching them and that got them back on board. Um, but in that case, I'd really encourage you to talk to your providers and explain he's really having a hard time going. We need some sort of reward system. We need to make this more enjoyable for them. Um, you can also have like a behavior plan in place too. So, you know, first we go to therapy, then we get an ice cream cone or like first we go to therapy, then you get iPad time. Um, having those first then paradigms for your therapeutic services can be really helpful with kiddos too, to just get them in the door. Um, but I would encourage you to first talk with your providers. Like we want them to help you to make it a more enjoyable experience for your child. I see a hands raised too. Hey, Martha. Right. Go ahead, Martha. Buenas tardes, ¿me escuchan? Sí, yo voy a hacer tu traducción okay. entonces, Martha. Okay. Uh, Aaron, I'll translate mi for hijo, you. Mi hijo, cada vez que vamos a una fiesta y tienen mm -hmm. que repartir el cake, mm -hmm. generalmente no le gusta. Yo le advierto que, por favor, si no le gusta en el momento que le dan su porción, él lo tira delante de todos, él lo, lo aplasta, hace un desastre con el cake delante de todos. Ok, so, dame un segundito, de... Marta, para uh, traducirla a uh, Erin. So, Erin, Miss Martha is saying that um, anytime her and her child go to, for example, a birthday party um, mm -hmm. and they get to the, um, when they're giving out the cake portion, she tells her child, like, if you do not like the cake, um, you know, please do not throw it. Don't, you know, um, mm -hmm. have a disruptive behavior. Um, Marta, continúa. Este, yo le digo, por favor, recibelo bien, lo dejas a un costado. Uh -huh. eh, yo, en todo caso, yo al término de la fiesta, yo te voy a comprar una pieza de cake que a ti te gusta, pero por favor, no hagas eso. Pero uh -huh. es, él dice, sí, 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 y al final siempre hace, eh, uh -huh. bueno, siempre hace lo mismo. Okay. Eso es mi pregunta, gracias. Ok, so what she was finishing saying is that um, she does tell her child, you know, please, you know, don't throw the cake, you know. You know, if you don't like it, just leave it on the side. Don't worry about it. I'll get you a cake that you like afterwards. However, even if she's offering this to him, he still will continue to throw the cake. So is there a way to curb this behavior? Got it. How old is your kid, Martha? ¿Cuántos años tiene tu niño, Martha? 14. 14. 14. Okay, got it. Okay. Um. So again, I think the first approach is always thinking about the ABCs, the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence. Um, so it sounds like the antecedent is just having a dessert at a party. Um, I think that, therefore, I would think a lot about what we're doing leading up to the party. You know, if this is a recurring issue over and over again, maybe we need to change the expectations for what's going to happen at the party. Um, maybe it's that no matter what party you're going to, we're bringing a different dessert, not an ideal situation. So that in that case, we might want to think more about the consequences of the behavior, right? So when the kiddo throws the cake, what are we doing in response to that? Um, how are we, you know, responding and how are we rewarding or making things different? You can also do practice situations too. I find this really helpful. So you can practice going to a birthday party and getting a cake that you don't like at home and then reward an appropriate behavior. So, um, you know, let's say that um, your kiddo only likes vanilla cake or something. You can practice, okay, there's no vanilla cake. What are we supposed to do? And maybe the preferred behavior is coming over to you and asking for the alternative treat instead. If that's what we want to shape, that's great. We can practice it at home and reward at home. Give a lot of verbal praise. Like, I love the way you came over and asked me for your preferred treat, something like that. Um, so I think that I would really focus on like rewarding an alternative behavior to throwing the cake instead um, and take time to really break it down into tiny, tiny parts to practice at home. That might be a helpful as well.
let me see if there's any other ones in the in the chat I might see. Oh, I like what Carson said too about breaking homework into little pieces so it's not overwhelming and scary, giving breaks to get up and walk around and have a treat. Yeah, perfect. We know that taking little chunking is what we call that in, in like the psych world. Sometimes you might see that on an IEP, chunking activities. Um, and that just means breaking things into smaller parts, um, rewarding after each smaller part. That's a great way to do things too. Oh, I see Monica raised her hand. Of course. Um, okay. Monica, ya puedes hablar. Um, Gracias. Buenas tardes con todos. Mi nombre es Mónica. Tengo un hijo de 13 años con diagnóstico de autismo. Estoy teniendo un comportamiento repetitivo en él. Cada vez que yo le doy una orden, él me dice, me responde, ¿qué pasa contigo? Y yo continúo con la, con la orden y él me repite qué pasa contigo. A lo que, ejemplo, hoy le dije que se ponga sus lentes cuando ya bajábamos a coger el bus. Es un recordatorio que se lo tengo que hacer todos los días porque si no se lo hago, él baja sin los lentes. Y hoy, cuando bajamos, le dije ponte los lentes y él me respondió como siempre qué pasa contigo y yo le respondí lo único que tu mamá hace es recordártelo y siempre te ayudo esa fue mi respuesta yo quiero saber cómo puedo bloquear esa respuesta que mi hijo me da siempre que yo le doy una orden ok gracias Mónica dame un segundito Mónica um, mientras estoy hablando con el intérprete um... Si nos puede traducir para Erin. So, Erin, if you could just give us one moment. Um, Martin, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Or if you could jump into the English channel to translate for Erin. Yeah. Hey. Oh, I had to jump into his channel. Is that what he's saying? I think so. Just okay. one second, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to do that. Let me see. Oh, okay. So, Aaron, if you go to interpretation, I think if you click on the globe and click Spanish, that's what you'll be able to do it. Okay. Let me, I'm going to stop sharing. Globe. Um... <laughs> Oh, okay. So now I, I'll go to the Spanish channel. English. Click, Click English, he says. Oh. Okay, in English. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay, I don't know if Monica gave her question already and I couldn't understand it. Oh, great, great. Sí, eh, yo fui, les dije que cada vez que yo le doy a la, una orden a mi hijo, él me responde qué pasa contigo hoy eh, y todos los días en la mañana le recuerdo que tiene que ponerse los lentes. Hoy lo volví a hacer y él me respondió, ¿qué pasa contigo? A lo que yo le dije, yo siempre te tengo que recordar porque te tengo que ayudar. El día que no se lo recuerdo, entonces él baja y ya en la puerta del bus se da cuenta que no, no tiene los lentes. Esa es la razón por la cual uh -huh. yo le digo, siempre le hago el recordatorio en el ejemplo de los lentes. Pero la conducta es que cada vez que yo le doy una orden, él responde, ¿qué pasa contigo? Mm, ¿Cómo puedo bloquear okay. esa respuesta de qué pasa contigo? Thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I understand. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Aaron. Okay, great. 
Um, I understand. So it sounds like there's two pieces going on. There's a piece going on with a, um, I guess like a tone of voice and a um, phrase that is a little upsetting. What's your problem? Not something all parents want to hear. And we want to change that behavior, like that response. So that's one response we want to change. But then I'm hearing another behavior too, which is forgetting the glasses. We want to make sure he remembers his glasses. Um, I see an opportunity there for two different like behavior interventions. So for example, let's start with the, the phrase, what's your problem? If we want to reinforce, you know, a more, um, kind response than that, um, you know, you can put a, a behavior plan in place for that too. Um, and I know sometimes too, I have parents who, who work with, who have older children and they think, oh, like stickers aren't going to work, which is so true with an older kid, stickers aren't going to work, um, for a behavior plan, but maybe it can be something else. So I've had parents who have kids who might curse, maybe, um, you know, curse might be like a, a better example. And they say like, if you curse, um, you know, this week, if you go the whole week with, without cursing, or maybe you get one reminder or something like that, we'll give you this reward at the end. So if you don't use a curse word this week, you get Sorry about that. I switched to my AirPods for some reason. That was weird. Um, so, so that's a, that's a good way to do a behavior paradigm where you can kind of, for the older kiddos, um, you might be able to have like a week long paradigm, um, and give a larger reward at the end of the week, say this week, or maybe for a whole day. If today you go through the whole day without saying this phrase, then we get this reward. Um, that might be helpful too. When it comes to the glasses bit, um, it looks like if you're, if, especially if your kiddo, depending on the cognitive ability of your kiddo, it might be helpful to think about some visual aids in the morning, like maybe at the door, you can put a visual aid that says like first glasses, then the bus. That might be helpful for them to see this, then that. Um, so that might be a helpful way for the glasses bit. But then if necessary, you can, again, also put a behavior plan in place. If you can remember your glasses before you walk out the door, we get this reward. Um, so that would be my advice for that situation. It seems like there's two separate behaviors happening and I would treat it as such. Thank you, Erin. And we do have a question from Christine in the chat. Um, she states, the difficult behaviors that I am dealing with um, is with a 15 year old who has recently last month diagnosed as atypical autism along with ADHD. He mm -hmm. goes to school late and misses the first and second periods of his high school classes. Mm -hmm. We are at our wits end to encourage him to go to school on time. Uh, secondly, he seems to prefer playing his video games versus doing his homework. Very challenging. Mm, okay. That does sound challenging. Um, so again, I think a good place to start with these things is to kind of take things one behavior at a time. And um, we want to pick the behaviors that are that are like the the top priority first. So in this situation, I would guess it's the going to school that's like a big priority, getting to school on time. Um, and I would suggest a simple behavior chart for this. I wonder, I actually just made one. Let me see if I can pull it up while I'm chatting with you. But, um, you know, even with older kids, I feel I do get this a lot from parents where, the, you know, you see behavior charts and you think like, oh, that's for little kids. It's helpful for the older ones too, especially some of our like neuroatypical kids. It just makes things super clear on what our expectations are and how we can um, get rewards. Um, let me pull up this behavior chart that could be used as an example. Um, Hmm, I might have to look for it a little bit. Um, but I guess a behavior chart you could do for your kiddo would be if um, you're trying to get him to arrive at school on time. So you would want to say like the exact time that um, depending on how your kid gets to school, do they walk? Do they take the bus? Um, 
however that happens, you want to make a super clear expectation. So for example, for some people, it might be, um, we have to be out the door at eight o'clock in order to make it to school on time at 830. So the behavior we want to shape is um, out the door at 830, like leaving for school at 830 in the morning. And then underneath it, we can have like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And you know, every time they accomplish their goal of getting out the door by 830, they get a check. And then depending on how many checks they they get, they get a reward at the end. So for example, and I would and I would always keep the reward paradigm low at first. You want them to feel how good it feels to reach their goal. So right now, if it's like your kid is never arriving at school on time, then I would make the reward like this week, if you arrive at school on time two times this week, then over the weekend, you get X reward, you get extra screen time, you you said your kid likes video games. So maybe like, um, you know, you get extra time on your favorite video game or like mom and dad will play your favorite video game with you. Sometimes kids like stuff like that. Um, so so I would try that first, like make a really clear expectation, be introduce it like, hey, we're going to try a new thing this week. We're going to be um I'm going to be having a new challenge for you. And it's for you to leave the house at this time every day for school. If you're able to do it X amount of times this week, then you get a reward and make the, the paradigm super clear. That would be, that would be my suggestion. I hope that helps. Thank you, Aaron. And since we only have three minutes left, I'll just take this last question and from the chat in Spanish. Um, Ms. Marta Macias is stating, my daughter has autism and ADHD. It's super challenging. Um, we have done behavior therapy. It works a little, but I think uh, it's missing a lot. My day is lost between her whims and behavior. I would like to know if there's more strategies that she can use for the behavior she's currently experiencing. Okay. Um, so, so it's, I'm glad to hear that that some of the behavior therapy has been a little bit helpful. I know for parents to a common complaint I get is that it's very time consuming to like keep in touch on the different behavior plans. Um, so I would say in terms of different services, there are a lot of options for autism. The classic and, you know, most empirically um, data supported treatment for for challenging behaviors with kiddos with autism is what we call ABA therapy. Um, so like applied behavior analysis therapy. Um, it sounds like that's something you've already been participating in. Um, we know that there's very good results from that. There's a lot of other options too for kiddos with ASD. So for example, a new therapy that's out there is called DIR floor time. So DIR floor time, I'll put it in the chat. Um, that's a new one. There's, it's, it's more of like a free flowing kind of therapy. It's very client led. Um, and it's very different from ABA. So parents who have done ABA and they're not sure about it, um, DIR floor time, um, can also be another option out there too. There's also tons of different, um, I'm not sure what type of school your child's in. If your child is in the public schools, there's a lot of different programs that I would encourage you to look into and services in your school. Um, I'm not sure how old your child is, but um, you know, there's the Nest program, the Horizon program are all New York City. Um, um, those are all New York City based uh, autism school options. Um, there's also a lot of services you can just get in school. So like different types of classrooms, there's ICT classrooms are often helpful for kiddos, um, and things like that. I'm also seeing a lot of things in the chat right now about, is there a parenting, um, virtual class, um, to help us? If you need another virtual class, I'm happy to come back. Um, a copy of your behavior chart. Yes, I can send a copy of some behavior charts. I'll I'll pull a couple up and I'll send them um, over to Synergia, to Tatiana to, to send out to all of you because I find that those are helpful. Is there a specialist or therapist their children might benefit from seeing? Um, 
So if you're talking about children with ASD, you know, a lot of things that we really encourage for kids, again, is some sort of behavioral support therapy. So ABA is usually the classic one that we recommend. Um, additionally, we know that with autism, there's a lot of challenges in language. So a speech therapist is also great. You can also find speech therapists that specialize in like social communication, not just like word formation, depending on where your child is at in terms of their linguistics. Um, and yes, I think we're out of time, but that would be my like quick, my quick advice. <laughs> we are out of time. I'm so sorry if you couldn't get to everybody's questions, but as I mentioned before, I will be sending up a follow-up email and providing you with Erin's contact information if you would like to speak to her directly about your specific child. Um, again, thank you so much, Erin, for such a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for those that participated and spoke through the chat, the Q&A box, wrote, uh, raised your hand. Um, it made for a very interactive uh, session today. We really appreciate that. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. You will be getting a follow-up email from me so you can contact me there directly. Um, thank you, Martin, for being your interpreter today. Um, I'm sure you did a wonderful job. Um, and for everybody that's still online, please just stay like one extra minute um, just for a poll that we have. It really does help us here at the Parent Center. Um, and again, Erin, thank you so much for being here. Um, I look forward to those behavior charts to share with everybody um, for the follow-up email. So thank you everybody for being here today. And for those watching on Facebook, thank you for watching there too. All right, so I'll be pulling up that poll now. And Erin, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one.